Greetings today from Botswana. Today we want to look at what is a private interpretation of prophecy. We also want to look at why my door is flying open on a windy day. But uh, it's, not the, it's not the Holy Spirit, I don't think, but he is here with us. Praise God. But we want to look at this a little bit. Uh, we look at this from the scripture. Uh, the key scripture is in 2 Peter 1.20, but I'm going to read from 19 through 21 at the end of 2 Peter chapter 1. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And of course, the focus here is knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So the question would be, what does that mean, private interpretation? And I would just start by saying, uh, you know, first of all, that prophecy can be very difficult uh, what well, I should say tricky, because what I see from Scripture is that uh, prophecy itself is not fully and perfectly known until after it happens. What we see admonished here, even in verse 19, is saying that we would do well to take heed to the words of prophecy, to listen to them, to watch for them, and to see what's going on. And then when the time comes, we will know it perfectly. Uh, we have some examples of this, but there is another brief scripture I will look at uh, from 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 10. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And so we see again, even here, it's saying we know in part. When Jesus came to this earth for his fleshly ministry, people knew that the Messiah was going to come. They were expecting him, uh, they were looking for him, but when he was here, even as it says in, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So it is something that they couldn't quite put it together, and even his disciples, though they came to confess that he was the Christ, he was the Messiah, they still didn't get the full picture of it. Until, until later on, after he had died, after he was resurrected. Uh, you see another example, perhaps, in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they were speaking in tongues, and Peter was saying, this is, these are the words of prophecy that were spoken by the prophet Joel. So he came to know it when it was done, and it was, it was perfect. But that's why we have to study it, to be ready. And that's why Jesus said to watch so diligently. Because prophecy in part can be a little bit mysterious. But God's word is true. But we need to beware of private interpretation. Because often it comes down to we are adding to the word of God or taking away from the word of God. And so it's one thing to even say, okay, we see something over here, which we think this is a fulfillment or a partial fulfillment of a prophecy, but how dogmatic can we be? So it is best to watch out for it. And I tell you this in truth, there are many people who just don't want prophecy to be fulfilled because it's usually something negative. In fact, legitimate prophecy that I see, when you're looking at scriptural prophecy, you are never seeing prophecy that simply uh, gives somebody an ego boost. And that is the prophecy that we are seeing today, by and large. We see it all around us. God will bless you. He will give you what you want. He'll take away your struggles, etc., etc. Even in Scripture, I mean, most prophecies are, are dark. And even if they are light, they have warnings with them. And so this is something to know. But I'd be concerned uh, when someone is taking a private interpretation and telling people, this is the way it's going to be. And I just have to tell you that most of the time, these people are not meaning to deceive. You know, they're trying to get, uh, trying to be helpful. 
sometimes in terms of their zeal, they get carried away and do things that they should not. But I hope today that I'll be able to give you, uh, I'll be able to give you a couple examples of what private interpretation is. And you may not agree with me on this. Maybe you've heard some of them. And if you've heard them and it's been drummed into your head and some respectable teachers that you care for or believe in have said it, you may not want to believe me. But I hope you can see at least what I mean and keep this before the Lord uh, to see how he will lead you on this. But again, uh, the admonitions about adding to the word or taking away from the word, we find them in Deuteronomy, Proverbs, and Revelation, more or less in the beginning, the middle, and the end of Scripture. Of course, I will have references to numerous scriptures uh, in the description, which is uh, my habit to do. All Scripture is taken from the King James Bible. Now, when it came to uh, it came to the time that we are uh, we're looking at now, of course, the end times. Lots of prophecy in the Book of Revelation and the Gospels, uh, and so. Over the years, one of the advantages, and I, I'm not clapping myself on the back, I think I've told you already, I didn't want to get into this subject in my life, you know, but I never had that indoctrination into the pre-trib rapture, like the real deep teachings and stuff that really came and started in 1833 in England with a preacher named Darby. And this, of course, came to America through, the Sco through Cyrus Schofield and the Schofield Reference Bible. And since this, that was uh, published in 1909, and now, as you can see, it's been over 100 years. Uh, these are usually of a dispensational ilk, and so this has been drummed into their heads. And unfortunately, what should have been only commentary of the word, for many became God's interpretation of the word to them. And it really wasn't. It was only, these were only the views of a private interpretation. So one that, that uh, you may have heard of, is in the parable of the fig tree. Okay, and it is said that the parable of the fig tree is alluded to in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it was often said that the parable of the fig tree meant Israel would reappear as a nation. Uh, I'm not sure where anyone got that idea. I'm not sure when the parable of the fig tree was posted. I do know that a very evil source wanted to bring Israel back as a nation listed uh, identifiably, at least from 1871. And of course, I have no, uh, though I once believed this was a fulfillment of that prophecy, I no longer believe uh, that the Israel in the Middle East has anything to do uh, with what we see, say, in Ezekiel chapters 34 through 39. But here is this parable of the fig tree. And so I will just take this from Matthew 24, and I will read it for what it says. But you know, in Matthew 24, Jesus was talking about the end, and in verse 3, his disciples asked him, his disciples came to him privately and asked him of the end of the world, of his coming, the signs, and what would happen. And from verses 4 through 31, Jesus was identifying what they would look for, what they would see. Okay, he gave them the signs, he gave them what they were asking for. So then in 32, he says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all those things be accomplished, or all these things be accomplished. And so people have taken this to say Israel would reappear as a nation. What can you gain in this passage that actually tells you that? To identify Israel with a fig tree? You can't find this scripturally, okay? And he just explains it. He said, in the same way that these signs would come to show you what's going on, these are the signs of the end. It's just like it is when a tree puts forth its blooms. You know that summer is nigh. So when you see these things happening, you'll know the end is near. It is even at the doors. Jesus posts the parable and he explains it. And even in the book of Luke, it says the parable of the fig. He says, behold, the fig tree and all the trees. So this is nothing profound. As a matter of fact, I even remember because Israel came back as a nation. Uh, I think it was uh, May 14th, 1948. 
in 1988, people were saying, oh, 40 years, is that's the length of a generation. Jesus is returning. He's returning. Well, guess what? We're over, we're like almost 35 years down the line since then, and it didn't happen. And that's because people are following this private interpretation. At least I can hope you see what I mean by this. Uh, but another one of the things that I had heard many times, as I, heard, as I had heard, there will be a last day's revival in the world. All oh, people will be turning to Christ, etc., etc. I've already spoken of in another video how in Revelation chapter 7, uh, for the new Bible versions, not the King James, not the preserved word of God, but they added the word the to great tribulation to make it the great tribulation. And by the addition of this one word, it makes it sound like multitudes will be saved during the tribulation. But the King James does not have that. It just says all these came out of great tribulation, not the great tribulation. So that's a deception that Satan has built into uh, one of the many deceptions he's built into these uh, revised uh, Bible versions. But I had wondered, where did this talk of revival come from? Because when, when his disciples were talking to Jesus, you never see him talking about a revival during the last days. And he compares it with the days of Noah, with the days of Lot. There was no revival recorded at this time. It just comes down to the time God has done his work. And judgment is about to fall. That's the way it is. But finally, one time I saw it as I was in a used bookstore. It was actually in a book by David Wilkerson, whom I consider to have been a great brother. And I hope to meet him one day. But he was repeating something I have no doubt was, uh, was brought forward by this pre-trib rapture doctrine. And here it is. It comes straight from the book of Joel in chapter 2. And I will read this to you, I hope. <laughs> I didn't do a lot of reviews, so I pray that you will have patience with me. But I was like, wow, that's how he gets that there's going to be a revival? Okay, and I was talking about the day of the Lord. I'll go to verse 2 in chapter 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many gener generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as the horsemen, so shall they run. Uh, let me skip down a little bit here. Let me skip to verse 11. Okay, it gives you a great identifier through here about this army. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? That was the passage, passage being used to say it's a revival. How in the world do you get a Christian revival out of this passage? As far as the the day of the Lord being dark and gloomy, as far as the army coming on and, and destroying in its path, that is in perfect keeping with the Antichrist army destroying in Jerusalem, you know, just before the Lord comes and wipes out the, the armies at Armageddon. It's in perfect keeping with other scripture. But somehow this was supposed to be a last day's revival. And it's like, well, maybe, I, and I read, I jumped to verse 11 because it says, uh, talks about the Lord's army. But the Lord says in Psalm 17, 13, that he uses the wicked as his sword. The wicked as his sword. Okay, so what is that? And also King Nebuchadnezzar, who brought judgment upon Israel, four times in scripture he was called the servant of the Lord. So this is certainly a, a mishandling of a prophecy, in my opinion. But I'm trying to show you, this is where they got the revival thing from. And it continued later, uh, a little later on. And this was, let's see what I have written down here, in 18 to 27. Okay, the thing is, in verse 18, okay, of, of uh, Joel chapter 2, you're not talking about the first part where the army is coming and destroying. Now you're talking about when the Lord has returned and you're talking about 
uh, the millennial reign of Jesus and such like this. However, when you look down through here, in verse 23, it says, Be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. The floor shall be full of wheat, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. This too was being said, that because he talked about the latter rain, this meant an outpouring of his spirit that would bring a revival. But the context of the passage is saying, this is the millennium. He is making the land again whole. He's restoring it the way it used to be. It made perfect sense to me, but this is why through years I never saw it. Okay, and these are examples of what are private interpretations of the word of God. And unfortunately, we see this in many, many, well, we, will, we could hear of it in many, many instances. And so this is why, like the, uh, like the citizens, the, the believers in the city of Berea in Acts 17.11, we should be searching the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. We want to know what God said, okay? And we will not know prophecy perfectly until after it happens. There are portions of the book of Revelation that I see that I think I know. I think I know some of the things coming, but I don't know it perfectly. I really don't. And I don't want people to, to blindly listen to me either. That would be an undue respect of persons. Those in Berea were commended. It said they were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the word daily to see if these things were so. So I pray that you would take the time to do that for yourself. Please be sure you're at least always referencing the King James Bible so that uh, whatever you are using won't lead you astray. May God bless.